Hello all, how are you? Hope all of you are doing fine. So today we are going to have a short discussion on premenstrual syndrome. When we were students, we thought this is just a theory topic because nobody came to us asking about premenstrual syndrome. Nobody, even if they had some symptoms, they never came for treatment. But no, it's not like this no, anymore. People are aware that there is something called as premenstrual syndrome and they also know that there is treatment available. So you are going to get lots of patients with premenstrual syndrome. So this is not a theory topic anymore. It has got highly practical importance. So at the end of the session, I think you should all be able to know what is premenstrual syndrome, what are the clinical features, how do you classify it, how to diagnose it, how to treat it, so all, and what are the differential diagnoses that you have to consider. All these things should be known at the end of this discussion. So let us take each of them. So all of you would have heard about premenstrual syndrome, isn't it? So premenstrual syndrome means it is the occurrence of some uh, physical and mental symptoms, which has got a typical increase or a typically it occurs in the premenstrual phase. Rather than what symptoms you are having, it is the timing of the symptom that is much more important. Some people might have only somatic symptoms, some people might have only mood related symptoms, but whatever be the type of symptom, if it either accentuates in the premenstrual period or occurs only in the premenstrual period, that's when you call it as premenstrual syndrome. So premenstrual syndrome is the occurrence of bothersome somatic and psychological. So you can see somatic and psychological or any of them can be okay in the second half. That is the most important thing. It should be in the second half of the menstrual cycle. Not only that, once menstruation happens, it should completely come down and there should be a symptom free period at least for one week after menstruation. So with a complete reduction and resolution after menstruation. So these terms are very important. So it could be either somatic or it could be psychological, but it should be happening in the second half with a resolution with menstruation. So that is the most important thing. This was originally described by Frank as premenstrual tension, but then the term was recoined as premenstrual syndrome by Dalton. As I said, it's not the symptoms that are important, but it is the distribution, when it occurs, the pattern of distribution and the negative impact it has on your life. Because most of us would be having some amount of problems in the premenstrual period. But suppose that symptoms are not significant enough to produce some bothersome problems in your life, then it's not a premenstrual syndrome. So along with the occurrence in the second half, it should be actually limiting your uh, physical activity or it should be pr producing more problems to your living. That's when you call it as premenstrual syndrome. So both this is important. It is a pattern of distribution and the negative impact on daily living. If you look at general population, as I said, out of three out of four females will have some amount of symptoms. But out of that, only 40 percentage will be actually having the premenstrual syndrome, which is having a negative impact on their life. Out of that, around 5 to 8 percentage might be having it really severe. And those are the people who are going to come to your OPD. And there is no genetic basis uh, for familial tendency. Uh, for working definition, we can always say there could be physical symptoms, there could be psychological symptoms, or there could be just a behavioral symptoms, which is not due to any other organic disease. So it's basically a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude other diseases which could mimic this. And it should always occur in the same phase of the menstrual cycle, that is in the second half of the menstrual cycle, and it should regress after menstruation. Only when these three criteria are met, then you can call it as premenstrual syndrome. So I hope that's clear. As I said, it is the timing rather than the type of symptoms that is much more important and it should have an impact on the daily activity. So symptoms could be physical symptoms, symptoms could be neurological or psychiatric symptoms. Many people, it can go up to a typical psychiatric like presentation, it could be behavioral symptoms. And usually it worsens with age. And uh, when you reach your perimenopausal period, that's where your ovarian cyclicity loses. So that's the time where the cyclicity of these symptoms also becomes abnormal. Coming to the physical symptoms, I think the most important symptom which we all hear from our patients is some amount of bloatedness, some amount of mastalgia. That is the most common symptom. Many of the people will be having it, but it might not be limiting their activity. But for some, it might be really bothersome also. 
there could be uh, some amount of edema, headache, excessive weight gain and all. Psychological symptoms and behavioral symptoms can be anything. It can range from some amount of irritability, anger, anxiety, depression, mood swings, decrease in concentration, uh, insomnia, so loss of confidence. So many uh, psychological and mood symptoms can occur.